Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a Veterans Day special. We'll speak with veterans who've served our country and we'll hear from the author of a book about the Morency Nine, a story of service and loss and the impact of war on a small Arizona town. That's next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the special Veterans Day edition of Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. We begin tonight with three who served our country and who are honored at the 11th annual Heroes Patriotic Luncheon hosted by the Veterans Medical Leadership Council. Manny Lugo is an Arizona native who was drafted by the Army in 1969 but volunteered for the Marines instead. He fought in many battles in Vietnam and sustained a shrapnel wound in 1970. Lugo came back to Phoenix and joined American Legion Post 41. He helped revive the the Marine Corps League's Ira Hayes Detachment, a community service organization. Lugo currently serves as commandant of that group. Also joining us is Tracy Lee, a third class petty officer in the U.S. Navy Reserves. She serves as an avionics technician providing maintenance on the C-40 Clipper aircraft. Lee is also the venture manager for ASU's Entrepreneurship and Innovation Group. And finally joining us is Les Nagy, a native of Northville, Michigan. He entered Michigan uh, military service, I should say, in 1950 and served as a demolition and construction specialist laying and disarming mines in the Korean War. My goodness, good to have you all with us on this Thank Veterans Day you. special. Thank, Thank you. you so much for joining us. Before we get, get too far here, Veterans Day, what does it mean to you? What do you want it to mean to others? I think it's a great way for veterans to get together, first of all, and for people to somehow appreciate what the veterans went through. Uh, sometimes if you're not from a veteran family or a military family, it doesn't really impact your life. But my father was in the service. Uh, I got a lot of friends who were in the service. They feel like uh, the people don't appreciate them. But on Veterans Day, we all come together as a, as a military family. Yes. And I think that that means a lot to, to the veterans themselves and for what they did for the country, for the level country. Tracy, Veterans Day, what's it mean to you? Oh, it means honoring those who've sacrificed so much for this great country, and it means reflecting on many family members I have in my history. My brother is uh, uh, currently a Lieutenant Colonel in the Army Reserves. My dad was 101st Airborne. A lot of family buried at West Point and served in many wars and conflicts, and it reminds me of uh, that spirit of what they gave so much for, and it also reminds me um, exactly why I joined the military and why I'm so proud to serve. But I want others to, to honor those that have given so much and are true patriots of our country. Les, Veterans Day, what should we all take from it? What do you take from it? Well, I think that everybody should appreciate the freedom we have because if it wasn't for the veterans, you would not be here. I go into schools and I tell the children the same thing. If it wasn't for the veterans, you wouldn't be here. And I really remember a lot when I was a little fellow. My Sunday school teacher was a World War I veteran. He would take us on scouting and then we had veterans program. I blew the taps at two cemeteries. It was three of us that blew taps. And that's what made Veterans Day for me at that time. Today, I noticed that uh, there's a lot of people that say, oh, you're a veteran. And uh, I say, yes, I am. And they shake my hands and move on with life. And, uh, but I, I feel good I served. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. It made me what I am today. That's, a, that's an interesting point, man. I want to get to you on this one. Uh, talk briefly about your service now. You saw action in Vietnam. Yes, you were did. injured shrapnel. Um, yeah. Came back, had some challenges coming back. First of all, what were those challenges? Are they still there? Uh, some of the challenges were when you're, <laughs> when you're coming back from, uh, from a combat situation, I think. Uh, and, it was five days when I left my unit. I was back in Viet I mean, back in San Diego. It took me five days to get out of, of the service. I mean, f 
five days before that, I was with my, with my unit. We were probably doing some kind of operations. And five days later, you're at home, and you think to yourself, well, you know, what am I doing here? Yeah. Uh, it's kind of hard to, to get yourself back into this life of uh, being back home with your family and your friends, and somehow you just don't fit in with them. You know, you're still thinking about the, the unit that you left behind, part of the, your military life. It's, it's not hard, I mean, it's not easy to coming back in and even today, uh, like this gentleman was saying, you know, you think about it, uh, I think about Vietnam almost daily. You know, uh, maybe, you know, I've, I've gone to the VA to, you know, try to get help. There's no help for that. I mean, when you go through something, it, it sticks with you. And your family sometimes doesn't understand what you're going through. With so. that said, Les said that he would never trade this. It's, it's, it's shaped him, made him who he was, um, considering the challenges. Would you trade your experience? I would never trade it. I've met too many men and women that are veterans, and I consider them my family. I would, uh, I would back them up in any situation, and there's no way that I would trade it, not one day. Tracy, you, uh, you are now involved in a lot of things along with uh, the U.S. Navy Reserves. Mm -hmm. Talk about the military experience the non-military experience and how the two impact each other in your life? Well, the military experience is something indelible. It's something, as Manny was saying, it, it doesn't ever leave you and it's a family that you have and it, it does change you in ways that you are so grateful for in so many, for so many reasons. But I fortunately have the opportunity with my work in the civilian sector with ASU to be able to work with veterans, to be able to help provide opportunities, to have some of those connecting points. I work with shipmates in my unit that go overseas and they are mobilized in Afghanistan and, and of course served in Iraq and they come home and it's harder for them to come to a civilian life because we don't have a military base they come back to for active duty, for example. So they're reservists that come back to mm. a lot of detachment in our community. And so I try to help knowing what that experience is like on the military side of it and help try to bridge some of that with the civilian side. But it's, it's the honor, courage, commitment, our Navy Corps values that I bring to everything else that I do in my civilian life. Let's, let, let's get to you. Uh, you're our, kind of our veteran veteran here as, uh, with the Korean War, Incheon, Heartbreak Ridge. You were there, huh? What were you doing? What was I doing there? I was laying mines and booby traps and disarming them. Uh, you don't, I come up and I tell people I wanted to get away from that trade because it's very dangerous. It is. No kidding. And uh, they wouldn't let me change, but they went through all the training from basic to the a specialty training. I had the flamethrower, I had mines, I, I set up barbed wire. I was laying mines one, one day and I was uh, uh, stringing Constantina wire in front of the line. So I, I go ahead and uh, I uh, am working my fellows there and uh, there's a guy up up above on the peak, up on the ridge. He's in a nest, we call it a nest, 50 caliber bunker. Got a slot about that big. And that's where the barrel sticks out. And he could see me down there. And he said, Sarge, he says, I wouldn't trade my job for anything in the world because I got this 50 caliber. And I says, well, I can't trade you. But the next day I got hit. The mortars came in and dropped on us, and I yelled, scatter. They scattered, and I waited till all 27 guys were gone. Then I picked myself up, and I started to go, and what happened? I got concussion from the mortar that came over, knocked me into a ravine. Well, I was unconscious for about seven, eight hours, and they picked me up later, and they brought me back to my area. I was all right. They gave me time to get straightened out, but I got a concussion from that mortar. And I, I, I stop and think about it. Also, I had, while I was in that position, the, uh, or the snipers got my boots three times, but they never drew blood on me. So 
Therefore, I was not entitled to a Purple Heart. Then I brought all the guys back, and I went back to my area, and uh, I was home about six months. And my mother called me and said, uh, Leslie, she says, you got a telegram. I said, oh, no. Do I have to go back in again? I didn't want to go back at all. And I, I was scared, really, because uh, they offered me OCS while I was there, and I said, no. And uh, so what happened is that I was awarded the, the Bronze Star for meritorious service, bringing in 27 guys alive, because the other battalions, they lost 40%. And uh, I didn't do it for the award. I done it because I thought that was correct. And now I have problem with PTSD. So you, do, you did develop post-traumatic stress? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, uh, they determined that here about a year ago, finally. Wow. It took a long time to pick it out. And uh, I get 60%, but what's 60% if you're not exactly right? So what I keep on doing, I keep busier than you know what, so I don't <laughs> think about it. That's, that's ex excellent <laughs> advice. And Manny, uh, PTSD is part of your, your life as well. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, you deal with it daily, and I'm, I've talked to a lot of veterans. Uh, sounds, uh, certain noise. Mm -hmm. You hear a you know, radio going on, you hear a song, it takes you back. Um, it's just, it just stays with you, you know, it, it, it doesn't, it's not something that you can go get help at the VA like they tell us to and, and they give you the magic pill, because there's no magic pill. You know, you live with the rest of your life and it's always there. But you stay active as well, you, for the Ira Hayes detachment now, you're the leader of that particular uh, operation and you are, you're the Marine of the Year. Aren't yes, you the 2013 Marine of the Year? I mean, right. uh, you are keeping busy, and you are still fighting the good fight. Yes, I am. I was the Commandant for the Marine Corps League two years ago, for two years. Now I'm the past Commandant. We have another uh, gentleman in there right now. But the Marine Corps League, uh, it happened that, that uh, Ira Hayes was sort of in limbo, the detachment. so. That was offered to us. We took it over, and well, I took it over, revived it a little bit. Uh, there was a lot of good guys that started the Marine Corps League of the Ira Hayes, but they're older gentlemen already. You know, their time is, you know, settled down. So we will get the younger guys in there to try to do something with it. But uh, the fundraisers that we do have, the money that we do raise, uh, goes to the Marines helping Marines that are coming back. Uh, wounded in different mm -hmm. hospitals, and not just the Marines helping Marines, because there's other branch of service in the hospital. So uh, that's our goal. And then with the with the Toys for Tots, the Marine Corps uh, Reserve is, has that in, or in charge of that, and our detachment is now in charge of the Central Phoenix uh, Toys for Tot program here, and we're doing really good. Uh, and that must make you feel good to do. It good. makes you feel yeah. real good when you see those kids come in and and pick out their toys, you know, so. Tracy, I want to close it out with you. These two gentlemen over here, that the military background is, mm -hmm. is tremendous, that the stories, uh, we could go on all day. I mean, these are fascinating gentlemen with fascinating lives, wouldn't trade it for the world. As a more recent military person, what do you think of when you hear these guys? They're the true heroes at this table. Honestly, it, it really, um, there really aren't any words adequately to thank them for their wonderful service, and I feel like, and I know that I haven't even come close to the level of service they have, but I'll keep trying to, to serve honorably and to try to thank them by my service and what I bring to the Navy Reserves to be able to thank them properly. Well, it's, it was an absolute honor. It was a pleasure to have you all here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your service, uh, for everything you've done for us, and uh, continued uh, good health and good life. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an Aid Insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the Aid Insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. In 1966, nine young men left the Arizona mining town of Morency to serve in Vietnam. Only three returned. Their stories are told in ASU history professor Kaya Longley's book, The Morency Marines, A Tale of Small Town America and the Vietnam War. Kaya Longley joins us now to talk about the Morency Nine. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Who were the Morency Nine? Uh, there were uh, eight young men who had just graduated from high school. They were joined by a friend who had graduated two years before, gone to U of A, but came back and they joined as sort of a band of brothers. So you've got a cross section of the town, three Mexican-American, one Navajo, uh, the rest are Anglo, but they're all the sons of either miners or people who worked in the smelters. And why did they decide to join? <sighs> a number of reasons, and I explore these complexities in the book. Major one, of course, is the draft. Uh, most of them, with the exception of two, had no anticipation of going to the, uh, college, so they didn't have a deferment. Uh, there are many other reasons. Their fathers had served. In Marinci, they're very proud of their military service. So they were following in the traditions that their fathers, their uncles, and others had established. And these were friends? These were people that knew each other, families that knew each other? Uh, Marinci, even then, a small town? Very much so. A town of 5,000. Uh, they played football together. Uh, they partied together. They went to church together. Uh, it's a very small, close-knit community, even today. So everybody knew everyone, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And they just joined as a group. Again, they thought, hey, we're going to go together, we're going to go together, and we're going to join the Marine Corps because we want to be with the best. But they wound up with different specialties, different deployments, I would imagine? They did. Uh, from the period of, uh, in the first wave, four of them went over on a ship together. Uh, but they dispersed once they hit South Vietnam. One was recon, uh, several were riflemen, Another actually was uh, to serve on an uh, air base. Uh, but it, over time, all nine went. And unfortunately, over the period, six out of the nine will die in combat. And yes, and that is this part of the story that is so wrenching. Um, not at the same time. So it sounds as though the town, this small town, had to go through these funerals one after the other. Talk to us about that. Yes, I mean, it was devastating. The first young man uh, to die, Bobby Dell Draper, was the star football player, the good, as self-described, Mormon kid uh, from a very prominent family in the community. And his death in August of 1967 is the first. But soon after, Stan King dies. He's the all-state tackle who uh, had been off at the University of Arizona. Uh, six foot five, 230 pounds with red flaming hair who only lasted six days in mm. country. Oh my goodness. Uh, so you've got these stories. Then Van Whitmer, then Larry West, who went back for his second tour of duty, dies on May 17, 68, followed by Robo Moncayo, who dies only after being in country 18 days. Three survivors. Yes. What did they go through? Uh, it, it was very difficult. The survivor's guilt was significant. Mm. Uh, especially Mike Cranford, one of the who lost his best friend Larry West in combat. They'd actually supposed to be out on a mission together, but at the last moment Mike got pulled off because he was a radio man and another company needed him. So they were supposed to be out in the same uh, operation. Larry dies, uh, Mike comes home. Mike struggles mightily, as do the other friends. How do you explain why I survive and my friends didn't? You know, they never age in their minds. They're 18, 19, their whole lives. But these, young, uh, these men age, and they deal uh, oftentimes very significantly with PTSD. Indeed, and I would imagine the town itself, uh, we talked about the funerals, we talked about the reaction there, but in general, uh, this is a story, uh, a big story, about a town as well, isn't it? It's very much the community. Uh, it's a mining camp. So it's a very unique community in many ways, dominated by Phelps Dodge during these days. There's strikes, uh, there's conflict, there's cooperation. You know, their fathers work 26 days on, two days off. It's hard labor, hard work, but they're very proud of their military service and the contributions they make to their country. Did the attitude toward the Vietnam War in the town, as far as you could tell from your research in, this, in the story that you've, you've told here, did it change over the years as these funerals piled up? It really didn't on the outside. 
I do think that it did on the inside. For example, the last young man to die, Clive Garcia, uh, his brother wanted to join. And while his mom and dad were very proud to say their son had made a sacrifice, when the youngest son went to join the Marine Corps, they, put a, uh, they squashed it and did not want to lose another son. So it, it, on the exterior, very strongly in support of the war. If anything, they complained we didn't win. Yes. But behind the scenes, I think there were a lot of people st that started the question, not like anti-war protesters, but just why do we have to make such a, uh, a sacrifice when others are not? Well, is, so is this, is this a typical or is this an atypical small town American story during the Vietnam War? I think it's a very typical. And I think their story, even though it's about nine young men from the same community, it's the story of a, Viet, a, a generation of Vietnam combat soldiers uh, that, have, that go off to war from small towns, farming communities, mining towns in West Virginia or Montana. These small towns, these small uh, you know, urban, uh, suburban uh, enclaves, oftentimes immigrant, take significant uh, casualties. And so there's a lot of things replicated, loss of friends, uh, the experience in combat, the PTSD they deal with, the uh, dishonor of many people heap upon them for their service, and how they have to overcome that. So there's a lot, there's some really unique characteristics. Again, in this group of nine for six to die, that's just a devastating yeah. loss. But at the same time, there are a lot of continuities and a lot of similarities with the Vietnam generation. How is the legacy of the Morency Nine preserved, especially in a town like Morency, which is literally changed from those days because uh, it, it's been swallowed up. I mean, much of the history of that town is now at the bottom of a pit. Very much so. It made it very difficult for me as a historian to recreate the story because it wasn't there for me. And I couldn't even see the physical characteristics. But what has been an important, and I think the story means more to people in Marinci because it's the way they hold on to their old traditions is through the stories because the physical characteristics are no longer there. So they have to hold on to these memories. And I think it's extremely important. And again, they'll be the first to say, you know, other Marinci, young men from Marinci served. Some died. But the story is just sort of a central piece of that story of remembrance. And is that why you wrote this book? Why did you write this book? Uh, it was just, I read a newspaper article in 2000. And I looked at it and I go, this, there is so much more to this story than just a newspaper article. It was a wonderful article, but I looked and went, this is an important story, not just for Arizona, not just for the Southwest, but for our country, for the Marine Corps, for the people who served in Vietnam, because their story is a story of many. And when you started to write the book, when you had an idea of what you wanted the book to be and how it would, uh, the, the results would be, when you wound up with the hardcover edition all set to go and all the work's been done, was it the same book? It is the same book. And I think what made it is because I wrote their story. That was my goal, is not to incorporate my story into the process. It was to write their story and the story unfolded. Now, it was a very difficult story because there were no central depositories of materials to mm -hmm. take and, and use. I had to do a lot of oral histories. I had to beg uh, families for letters and diaries, and they were very, many of them were very forthcoming. A lot of the families wouldn't even talk to me though, because it still hurts so bad. 40 something years later, to have lost a brother, to have lost a son. So it was a very difficult process, but one where many people in Marinci embraced me and helped me. Well, with that in mind, now that the book is out, now that folks have had a chance, well, they will have a chance here, it's just, just recently released, but um, are you expect, what kind of response are you expecting from this? I expect a good one, because again, the people who have read the uh, advanced galleys are very strongly supportive of it. And these are scholars, these are people that are not even tied to Marinci. But I think the people in Marinci are going to enjoy, well, as much as you can enjoy this, to a degree, a very sad story. They want the history remembered. And Leroy Cisneros just died, uh, one of the survivors. And his comment to me was always, I want my friends remembered. I want my sons to know about Bobby Dell Draper, my best friend. And I don't want them ever forgotten. Well, it's a, it's a great piece of work. Congratulations on the success of completing the book and good luck with your future and the book's future. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you for joining us on this special edition of Arizona Horizon. You have a great evening.
Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.